Welcome back to yet another episode of Matrix Tech Talk. Today, I have a very, very interesting guest from across the Atlantic, Piyush. Piyush, welcome to Matrix Tech Talk. Thank you. So uh, let me tell a little bit about Piyush. So he worked 18 years at Ford Motors and now he is leading the automation industry globally at Siemens. So Piyush, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself, your passion, your background? Yeah, by, uh, by trade, I'm a mechanical engineer. Started my career with that mechanical uh, background with CAT CAM, CAE, and you know, mostly I was a CAE guy at the time, back in 92. And then uh, slowly got into, um, as I came here to US, I got into electrical systems. That's how I joined into Ford uh, you know, back in 99. And within Ford, then I started getting into more of the in-vehicle software side of it. So now I'm like king of king of nothing and jack of all kind of thing. So I've been from mechanical to electrical to software. And, and that's how I landed here in, uh, in Siemens. I love that. You know, it's very rare that we get someone who can talk about uh, vehicle development all the way from vehicle level, electronic system, software development, and also safety, security. So this is, this is amazing. I'm really excited about it. So today um, we want to start with embedded software development automotive. So we have a complex supply chain. We have the OEMs, we have the tier ones, we have the tier twos and the tier threes. And when you think about a vehicle till tier three, there are about 3000 companies involved behind a vehicle. And you worked for a long time with the OEMs. Now you're working with Siemens. So you know both the perspectives. So can you tell us a little bit about the challenges in automotive uh, embedded software development. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think right now we are in amazing times, amazing times. You know, uh, I was talking to a, a buddy of mine at Ford and, you know, we just happened to talk about this thing and he said, you know, about, it's been about 120 some years that automotive industry has, has been around. And before that, it was horses, horse carts that was being, you know, turned around. That was the automotive industry at the time, right? Horse carts. And then came you know, automobiles and you know, there was a major transition that happened from horse cars to the sort of IC engines or automotive industry kind of changed. That's the kind of disruption we're seeing it now in our industry right now, when we're changing from traditional automotive to you know, more like uh, personalized, personalized automotive, you know, which you know, uh, sharing and ride hailing and you know, autonomous vehicles around the corner and things like that. That's the kind of disruption we're looking at. And um, you know, OEMs and uh, suppliers equally are, are part of that disruption. And they're trying to see, okay, hey, where the automotive industry is going to be um, you know, two years, five years, 10 years from now. And you know, bottom line is software is the answer, right? Software is what's going to take you you know, to that, to that space, to the disruption. So yeah, everybody is going towards that. And obviously that, you know, poses enormous, enormous challenges. I mean, you, you think about, um, you know, the way vehicles are designed uh, today, everything is driven by vehicle margins, obviously, right, for automotive industry, uh, OEMs for, for in particular. And most of the software in the last, I would say, uh, you know, 10 some years, if you will, has always been designed from a sort of ECU centric position. Like, you know, what goes in that ECU? How do we you know, design applications for the ECU? Where on the other hand, the, the vehicles are driven by margins on the features that the customers buy. So one of the challenges there is how do you transition from this sort of ECU centric um, mindset to a feature centric mindset that okay, if we have, if you want to sell a feature, uh, first of all, understand what the feature is, how the customer uses it, does the customer actually use it, and then engineer that onto your vehicles and then optimize uh, you know, how the applications go on the ECUs. But that's a big challenge. Uh, another one um, I would say is like scalability aspect of it. Traditionally, vehicles, we looked at a vehicle by itself, like just the vehicle, is, you know, within the vehicle, what happens and how you engineer the vehicle. But now... A lot of these features, a lot of these vehicles uh, are thinking outside of that vehicle. So how does the vehicle interact with the infrastructure? How does the vehicle interact with the human, you know, who are having to get in and out of the vehicles? All that kind of stuff is coming in. So vehicle is not just the vehicle by itself now. It's a system of systems. So now how do you design for that? How do you define 
the design for that kind of scalability. The features that, for example, Tesla, you know, right? The features that you have right now in the Tesla, you know, from a hardware perspective, from a software perspective, are designed to be scalable for the next five, 10 years. So you don't have to buy a new vehicle. All I'm going to give you is a new software feature and that will switch on your rear uh, heating, you know, your rear seat heating, right? How do you design for that kind of scalability? I mean, that's a big challenge. And then another one I would think of is agility, right? The pace of the software technology itself is changing. Uh, the hardware is changing. Uh, if you look at the sensors in the last five years, the amount of uh, smart sensors and the capability of sensors that are available now versus, you know, what was available two years ago. I mean, it's enormous changes happening there at the pace that, at, at the pace at which I don't think automotive industry is kind of geared for that, that kind of pace. So how do you catch up to that uh, and, and use that technology pace in order to, you know, build these features into the vehicles? I mean, that, that translates into how fast you can, um, you can, you know, build these uh, features all the way from R&D to the vehicle. So, you know, when you talk about R&D in, 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 you know, in suppliers or in OEMs, the stuff that R and D guys do is like five years out, ten years out kind of stuff, right? So, hey, how can we build these features for for the next future? Uh, but the vehicle teams are asking for those features now. Like we need that now. You know, we need this smart, you know, camera systems now. So, how do R and D guys optimize their work with the existing infrastructure that's on the vehicle and be able to seamlessly, you know, put uh, new and new features rapidly into these vehicles because that's where the margins are going to be. That's where the differentiation is going to be, you know, with this software aspect. You know, you look at any vehicle today on the market, you go and buy, uh, you know, I, I was in the market a few years ago to buy a new car, and I was, you know, comparing, you know, five different vehicles, and I couldn't see a whole lot of difference. It's like, hey, maybe just, you know, it looks, you know, slightly cluttered or slightly simplified from an IP, uh, you know, instrument panel standpoint. But features-wise, it's pretty much all the same. So how do you differentiate in this kind of a you know, sort of market? And software, obviously, is the answer and the pace at which you can put new features in the vehicles. Um, that, that's going to that's gonna cut it. I mean, another you know, challenge is obviously complexity, um, compliance, right, 26262 and things like that from safety perspective. It's not that we have not been complying uh, to standards. It's the, the challenge is more about how do you reduce the efforts to comply to these standards? Um, first of all, to understand it is what the standard is asking for, and then be able to reduce uh, some of the work uh, that is required to comply. And that's a big challenge. Um, another one is testing. Amazing challenges in the testing area, especially when it gets to sort of next-gen ADAS or uh, um, AV systems. Uh, even level three, you know, testing these kind of features is, is a big, big, big challenge. How do you sort of left shift it so that you can do these testing up front uh, and not find issues later on? Uh, do it virtualized and sort of not eliminate but reduce the physical testing as much as you can because you can do a lot of testing with virtual, uh, you know, virtual testing and stuff. So that's a big challenge. How do you do that? And then I guess one of the biggest challenge is the distributed teams aspect of it. A lot of OEMs uh, work with global suppliers across, across the globe uh, and be able to effectively do these kinds of things. You know, when I talk to the OEMs and, and on my own experience uh, at an OEM, is knowing what's on the, on the vehicle is half the battle won already. We just don't know what's on the vehicle from a feature standpoint and how many, how many people are actually working on that vehicle. Getting some sort of an efficiency on knowing the the global reach of these features and functions going across and bringing back that whole supply chain, enormous challenges there. So I mean, it just maybe a long answer for your question, but uh, I'm just too passionate about um, you know these challenges going on and the opportunities that it creates. Amazing. So you really set the premise really well for today's discussion. You talked about challenges all the way from complexity, all the way from features, not ECU centric. Uh, views and even you you touched the compliance issue and you talked about the agility issue too you know the traditional way of developing and uh, what's going to be the way of developing in the future now let's dive down into these these topics a little bit how about starting with the 
notion of complexity because complexity relates to all of these features you talked about. Yeah, ADAS, AV, these things are going to make things more complex. And we know that software is growing at an exponential rate. We're adding one level of complexity in every, every year now. So one level of complexity, one level of more, more abstraction, yet another layer of abstraction in the, in the software architecture. We're adding it, so things are getting more and more complex. How do you think the tool development, along with this or embedded uh, software development com complexity was, should go hand in hand because it is going to be massively complex. No human will be able to handle these millions of lines of code unless we have the proper tooling, proper way of abstracting. And there's also a chance of error propagation in each of these abstraction layers, which can cause security, safety, or even bugs that will be even more co uh, complex to fix in the future. I guess I'm going to give you uh, sort of my own experience, you know, back and forth, uh, you know, probably about 2007-ish, 80-ish time frame. We started to figure out, so, hey, you know, how many features do we actually have globally, you know, in a motor company? And, you know, that itself was a daunting task. Anybody you ask, you get a different answer, right? So, you know, one thing was to sort of accumulate this knowledge into one single place. That, okay, how many features do you have? How many software features do we actually have uh, at a vehicle perspective, at a vehicle platform level? And then be able to decompose those as to okay, what, if you know, let's say adaptive cruise control or uh, emergency braking you know, as, as a feature, what functionality is needed to actually do this feature, irrespective of who's going to implement that, right? Um, so having that sort of decomposition or architecture, if you will, eventually we started calling it more sort of feature-centric architecture-driven process where everything was driven by a feature. We had a decomposition of that feature into functional elements and then have everything else driven by that architecture that this is what we want to do, guys, and then find out, so, hey, I have these 100 functions that are needed for AEB out of these, these 59 are going to be done by this ECU and hence that or these two suppliers. And these 29 features are going to be done by, you know, ABS or whatever be the case. So now we start to say, okay, now from a logical standpoint, who is going to implement these functions? So if you do that across the platform, that started to give us that notion of complexity. Is, okay, how many features do we have? How many different ways of doing this feature do we have? Uh, for example, if you do, um, uh, adaptive cruise control. Uh, you could do the do it with the camera-based system or with a radar-based system or a combination of the two, right? So now we have two or three or five different ways of doing the same feature, you know, just from a functional standpoint. Then you start optimizing it and say, hey, no, I don't want to do it. I do not want to do this in five different ways. I want to do it in more more uh, logical ways so that I can optimize on the hardware side of it, right? Because this whole another uh, aspect of complexity is the hardware complexity, you know, that the push is to reduce the hardware complexity to the point where, for example, at, um, you know, we were looking at body control modules. Across the vehicle platforms, how many body control modules do we have? There were like, you know, more than 20 different body control modules that were across vehicle programs. That, we reduce it from a hardware perspective, we reduce it down to three. There's a high content, medium content, and a low content VCM. And that's all, right? So now you reduce enormously the hardware complexity, but obviously that translated that all that complexity which was there across those 20 ECUs now transferred over to the software side. So now how do you capture that? So now the only way to capture that is in this functional architecture. What functions do we have to support across these three VCMs and apply that across the you know many 25 different vehicle programs? So that was a way of kind of getting hold of the complexity aspect of it. Fascinating. So the example you gave is really um, worth you know, discussing about. So my follow-up question would be, the tools that we are developing today yeah, uh, in such feature that uh, would reduce complexity for software development or add complexity to it, how do we deal with the, the propagation of error or faults in the abstraction layers. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, so Siemens, uh, and that was actually one of the reasons I joined Siemens, by the way, is, you know, Siemens now has a lot of tool sets that are 
at different abstractions, as you called it, right? You have a system of system level abstraction where you're capturing, you know, how the vehicles shall interact with the surroundings, right? So what we call mostly like an operational analysis. How does the vehicle operate in its environment? So you have tools like the system modeling workbench and things like that and teams that are integrated with it. To capture that level of sort of call it behavior modeling and understand as to what functions do we need, what functions are going to behave in what way, and be able to assign the right requirements to it or develop requirements, define requirements from it and say, okay, this is what we want to have the vehicle behave. And these are the actual attributes that we are going to monitor it with. So, you know, make more objective you know, rather than subjective requirements uh, and capture it at the system or system level. Have that cascade down to the electrical domain, right? So, okay, hey, now we know how the vehicle is going to behave. These are the different, you know, 100 functions at a, at a vehicle level. Out of these 100 functions, here are the, you know, uh, 29 functions that go into the electrical domain and say, hey, this is how we can electrically connect everything, or these are the 50 uh, uh, functional requirements that are going into the software side of the deal. And now we have a connection between how the vehicle is going to behave and then how each domain is going to take over uh, which portions of that system behavior. And then for the cascade down to the electrical side of it versus the software side of it, saying, hey, now for the software side, Okay, fine, you have all these features that are interconnecting and, and being implemented. This is why you're doing what you're doing, kind of thing, because we already assigned, you know, verified the operational behavior at a system or system level. So now we have cascading down to capital systems on our electrical side, which totally takes care of all the way from electrical distribution to electrical optimization to network communication, to bandwidth optimizations, and things like that, and all the way down to the base software level, to the embedded software development level, you know, all the way down to the OS, uh, OSR, or adaptive OSR for SOA kind of things. And then on the other side, be able to develop the software in a more orchestrated way, uh, with Polarian being sort of the orchestrator in between that connects to all these pieces, you know, one side is connecting to capital, another side is connecting to team center, another side is connecting to the IDE where you're developing the software and to all the test routines that you're want to run, the build management, so all these things are kind of orchestrated from one single environment uh, that connects to whatever it needs, you know, whether it be architecture or modeling or QA or, or the build management kind of it. And then be able to, once you have that software, then be able to deploy that back into sort of the bill of material side of the, of the of, on the vehicle side. So another big deal um, from pain point perspective, obviously, is what software needs to be on a certain vehicle given the set of features that it has, right? So you, you're saying that, okay, from a marketing standpoint, here are the features that I need on this vehicle. But that eventually boils down to a specific ECU, and that ECU has a certain binary that sits on that ECU, and likewise, you know, 70 or 60 other ECUs on that vehicle. So what binary, which specific binary, which specific configuration, which specific calibration needs to be for that vehicle? So that's where we capture in the bill of material in Team Center. So now this polarity basically connects back into that and says, now I develop this binary, here's where it goes, and we release it there and then ship it down to the plants and the dealerships for uh, service actions and such. So that's sort of the whole call it ecosystem, if you will, of things that, you know, software needs to, to work with. And, you know, I think the Siemens probably is the only company now that has all these domains uh, available within the single vendor and be able to connect to them and increasingly start integrating all these tools together so that the data flow becomes more and more robust, uh, more and more seamless as we go forward. Fascinating. Now that you've mentioned also about shipping it to, to all the way to the vendor, I think that's a perfect segue to talk about another point you mentioned while you were talking about the challenges, which is agility. We will definitely be moving toward a different way of development. So in my opinion, traditionally the way we've been developing, we, for example, for functional safety, we certify our code and we freeze the code and then we don't touch it. We're not supposed to touch it. If we change it, if we, change, if we ship a patch, we're supposed to recertify. Obviously, security is not going to let you do that because you have to keep shipping patches. 
I think it's not only security, it's going to be features that's, that's going to require you to do such things. For example, we see certain kind of scooters in Munich these days. That kind of object was not there. These e-scooters were not there five years ago. Road conditions will change. So just for the sake of features, you'll have to keep shipping patches or updates. So the idea of, you know, you freeze your code at SOP and end of development is obsolete. So we'll need a new kind of agile-like development process. So what do you think of that? The challenges you know that in automotive, the difference between the way they do the development in Silicon Valley and us is they can ship a product, a SaaS product or something without having any major certification or any major hurdle, nobody's life will be at risk, right? We can't do that because we'll be risking people's life. How do you think we can balance that in, in our future way of development? The way I kind of bin all these things together is you have a, um, what I call as developed uh, or as, de as design area where you are doing most of the sort of feature architecture or feature decomposition and functional interactions, making sure the interactions are captured right. So that kind of work happened as what I call it as design level. Out of that, the result of that is discreetly defining as to how you're gonna, what you're gonna develop, right? Is it gonna be on ECU level? What is it that you're gonna develop? And once you have that developed, where does it go? you know, from an as release standpoint. So you have the as design, you have the as develop, and then that goes into the as release. Once you release it, like you said, things change, uh, and then you need to worry about how you're gonna affect, how you're gonna leverage maybe that change, right? Scooters are out there now. How do you interact with that environment, right? So now you gotta go back into the as design or as develop areas and say, okay, now these are the pieces that I'm gonna touch, and these are the pieces I'm not gonna touch. And that's where you do this sort of operation analysis and things like that to understand how your vehicles are gonna, gonna adapt or how your vehicles are gonna interact. And what does it mean discreetly to the sort of feature architectures on the software side, right? Which pieces should change and which pieces should not change. And that affects directly into sort of your as developed area, which is you know, what goes on the ECU and which pieces of the ECU should change. Um, so that should be more of a derived information rather than you know, somebody saying, okay, let me change this on my ECU side and propose that, right? And then once you have that affected, now as you go into this as release area and as build and as service areas, now you have a full chain of traceability, right? That's the key area, like traceability aspect of it, right? Do you know why you're making that change? As long as you know why you're making the change and you have sort of the gravy train to, to prove it, that this is the operation analysis I did, this is the requirements I captured, these are the attributes I changed, and this is what it affected from my feature architecture perspective, the feature functional decomposition, and that's where I got these two functions that need to change on my ECU, right? 20 other ECUs affected, but this is what my ECU, what, what it means to my ECU, and this is why I want to change it. As long as you know that part, you know, then it's easy to uh, kind of have that case be done and, and, uh, and ensure that the you know, safety of it is, is done, all the safety concept aspect of it is kind of captured and all that. I mean, that is how uh, the OEMs are, are, are doing it now, or are trying to do it rather, I would say. Uh, everybody's kind of struggling with this whole, uh, and anywhere I go and talk about this sort of feature-centric architecture-driven process, Everybody's like, yes, that's the way to do it because now we know, you know why we're doing what we're doing and where, where things are and who's developing it uh, and be able to optimize the release of it and uh, uh, sort of the collaborative effort needed to do these kinds of things. Fascinating. So to put this in probably in the safety context, what you've just mentioned, you know, what part of software, you should know what part of software you're going to touch and what part of software you're not going to touch. So typically the thing that you're saying OEMs are trying to achieve is you put your safety critical code in a, inside a safety envelope and uh, you have another layer where you can take changes, you can take over there updates and things like that. And you don't touch the 
piece of software that you have within that safety envelope. Now, here is my question, and we, as you know, as you have mentioned, tr the OEMs are trying to do this. This is where a lot of people are struggling these days, is when it comes to security, that security can have safety impact, and you have to keep shipping updates for your security module, which will be probably outside of the safety envelope. So in a way, you are, you are touching codes that would be safety relevant. And this is a problem that the industry is right now struggling to deal with. How do you think we should go about that? You know, people talk about safety and talk about, you know, um, security aspect. So there's a whole aspect of the hazard analysis, right, from the safety side. And on the security side, there is a whole aspect of the threat analysis, right, the threat assessments and all that. Although most of the time, um, you know, I feel that they, they seem to have like a siloed kind of effect that, okay, you know, HARA is done and PARA is done, but not really together, right? So the tools that we have now, you know, from Polarian perspective or Team Center perspective, where or you know, you know, where, what the functional train is, the functional chains allow you to now do the HARA and TARA together. So once you do that kind of stuff together, now you know, so, hey, do I really have to touch this code because of a security issue? Or what are the implications on the hazard side of it when you are assessing the threat side of it, right? So be able to do that in one single environment, a more collaborative environment, uh, and be able to you know, leverage capabilities like suspect links, for example, that we have in our tool sets, where if somebody touches something, uh, even at a requirement level up front, without him changing stuff, the other guys were affected by it or potentially affected by it, get to know right away. As soon as they log in, they know that, okay, maybe my requirement or my code or my test routine may be affected because somebody else is changing somewhere, somewhere, right? So tool be able to do that for you and have those kinds of ripple effects captured right away. Uh, I mean, those are the kind of things that we need that we have now in our tools, whether it be Team Center or Polaria, and we have both, and allow them to do these sort of integrated approaches. You know, so this whole we call integrated realization, where when you're changing stuff, before you change it, the impact analysis is provided by the tools. Um, so those are the kind of things you need for these sort of safety and, and security and others. I mean, it's not just safety and security from a change perspective, right? Uh, you could be changing something in electrical, for example. It doesn't, maybe it doesn't even affect your software code, but that affects, let's say, the bandwidth of, of, the, of the network that you are on, right? You, so I added some function to another, another ECU, and that affects another, uh, you know, they, they change the memory on that, some hardware change happens, and then they're, now they're all, of, all of a sudden there is a, um, a potential um, bandwidth issue. Be able to do those kind of things in the electrical domain before you make the change and then cascade it down saying, hey, I want to make this change. I'm going to add another security feature to my ECU, but by the way, it affects your ECU as well because you're on the same CAN bus. Uh, things like that, right? So we can do those kind of things now that we have the electrical, the network, the operational, and the software side all connected. Fascinating. That is another perfect segue to get to another aspect that you mentioned is testing. You talked about requirement, yeah? So we have been traditionally doing requirement-based testing. Like you said, your security will have impact on safety and many others. I think a third component that we can easily bring in here is SOTIF, safety of intended functionality, will we'll have impact on, on one another. Now, I'm curious about your tools, your tool systems that you have, the tooling landscape you have. Do you have anything that uh, deals with scenario-based testing? Absolutely. I mean, that's one of, uh, one of the biggest areas that we have now, what we call virtual VNV. The entire framework around uh, having scenario-based testing, you know, specifically for that reason that you mentioned. You know, one of the challenge, I guess, uh, you know, like Elon Musk once <laughs> said about, was how do you know what scenario you need to test, right? There's going to be enormous number of scenarios. So one way around that, obviously, is it's a you know obvious challenge. But the one way around that is to be able to capture the real world 
aspect of it. You know, when you're driving things around, when you're driving you know, vehicles around, you have the cameras already on, the, on your vehicles. Be able to capture that data. And that real-world example of when you are going on a freeway and all of a sudden a vehicle is merging, whether you slow down or you accelerate, those kind of scenarios are captured on, on, the, on the vehicle itself. And those real-world scenarios now can be transposed into synthetic uh, scenarios that you can actually test with uh, and add a lot of noise factors to that same scenario. So one is to identify out of these real-world scenarios, whether it be accident databases or you know, real-world camera feeds, um, and then be able to define as to which of these scenarios are critical to the algorithm that you're designing right now, right? The algorithms that you're defining or the software you're writing, which of these scenarios you really have to test out of the hundreds and thousands of them, right? So be able to do that intelligently. That's one aspect. The second aspect is, you know, add noise factors, as I said, right? So same scenario. If you, if you identify, let's say, these are the, you know, 100 or 200 or 400 scenarios that I'm going to test for my control algorithm that I'm making changes to, same 100 scenarios now can be tested for rain, for snow, for sleet, for slippery conditions. Same scenario, all these different aspects of noise, if you will, can be added to these scenarios and be tested. And tested in a, in a more scripted way that you can just go out there and let it run for the night. In the morning, you get back your results. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is when you're actually doing what we call virtual hill. So virtual hill basically is you're driving, physical vehicle, you're driving on the test, um, test track, but the vehicle is thinking because we superimpose the sensors with this, these scenarios, uh, and the vehicle is thinking that it's in traffic. It's somebody's crossing the road or something like that. The vehicle is thinking that, oh, there's somebody in my way and it has to stop automatically. So that's the testing you're doing, whether the emergency braking will work or not. And you're just going on the, on the test track, and the vehicle is undergoing all these different scenarios because the sensors are not superimposed by these scenarios. And you can do a whole lot of testing, uh, what we call the sort of niche testing, you know, the specific use cases that you really have to test. It's not about how many miles you drive and test. It's about what scenarios you test with. Right, what are the critical ones that you test with? And that's where sort of the regulations and everything is also going. That, okay, hey, if you test these specific ones, then you know the, the chances that your vehicle is or your, your algorithm is going to be safe and or secure. So these scenario-based testing with uh, the tool we have called uh, TAS, you know, a company that we acquired uh, a few years ago, there's a, there's a tool called PreScan from TAS. Um, the PreScan does all these kinds of things where you can do these scenario-based testing, and not only on the, on the vehicle, but also on the occupant side. So not just the, you know, testing for the algorithms on the, on the vehicle side. So how will the, if you have actual models for the human anatomy. So people who are sitting in the car, how will they behave? How their bodies will behave when all of a sudden you're braking, how fast you're braking, you know, how sudden you're braking, or how sudden you're swaying to kind of get away from a car that's merging in or something, right? So you're going to get thrown like this in the car. You can simulate that with now scenario-based testing uh, in our tools. Be able to do that and sort of optimize this sort of human response within the vehicles as well, the human occupant responses to different algorithms. So be able to do all those kind of things in sort of virtual world is just fascinating to me, man. We, I couldn't have thought about that, you know, just maybe, you know, five years ago. And now all of a sudden we have all this technology, all this you know, computing power to actually do all these kind of things. Amazing. Amazing. And to see these tools come up, unbelievable. Fascinating. So uh, let's talk a little more about that. So we've heard that from companies that we need trillion miles, 10 trillion miles of data. Some companies said we need 7 trillion miles of data. But actually what you've mentioned, it's not about the trillion miles, it's about the critical scenarios the danger scenarios. Here, we are located in the north of Munich where BMW's auto, autonomous campus is located. We see the BMW uh, test vehicles, autonomous vehicles are driving around. It's one thing to drive around, test your vehicle in this nice suburb of north of Munich, but another thing is to test it on the fourth lane of the German highway where we have 
the crazy thing is we have no speed limit. So now it's also not ethical in a sense to put a human to drive in such scenario to test it and also not to put other people in people's life in danger. So I always talked about three different scenarios. So we need simulations. This is what you, one you have mentioned. What Uber is sort of doing, Uber and Tesla also probably, is kind of like building virtual cities where they want to test. And we need to validate those hypotheses that we'll get from simulation uh, virtual cities in real life. We need to validate them. This is the end of the day what we, we have to do anyway. So you mentioned a very interesting thing in between, I think a fourth scenario is virtual hill. I, I like that. So can you talk a little bit about the virtual hill part and uh, what can we do with that that is closest to the actual real life scenario? A lot of crazy things are happening around here in Siemens, man, because uh, Siemens obviously is you know, a lot of other things going on in Siemens as well. One of the areas is uh, Siemens mobility, you know, it's basically trying to see as to how we can integrate infrastructure into vehicles and vehicles into infrastructures and things like that. And they're bringing tools where we can actually get real life um, high fidelity 3D models of cities for these sort of scenario building applications. So it's not just the vehicle itself, but also the city is totally virtualized. You know, so you're driving through, it's not a fictitious road. It's actually, you know, it might be Munich, you know, where, you know, you go in a downtown and you know, you're turning around and going from point A to point B and superimposing all these different uh, scenarios where all of a sudden the sun is going to be in your eye kind of thing. And all of a sudden there's a big glare coming into your eyes and how the vehicle is going to respond because there's going to be a camera adjustment needed from a calibration standpoint and the response of that camera that is needed to be able to adjust to that glare of sun. Things like that you can simulate now all of a sudden in, in the total virtual environment without ever, ever going into the road. And then eventually, obviously, you have to do some physical testing, right? And that's what I was calling the virtual health part of it, that we are, you're basically you know, driving in, uh, in, in Dearborn but the vehicle is thinking it's in Munich, right? So, so that's the kind of stuff you'll be able to do now because we have this high fidelity map data, high fidelity city data with a tool called AIMSUM and then be able to integrate these scenarios uh, with that. So to go, hey, you know, I need the road, I need the trees, I need the signals, I need everything. I need people walking around, people on bicycles. I need all that data so that my vehicle thinks that it's really in the actual driving situation where I'm going to drive uh, on my test track and be able to uh, have the vehicle think that's in the traffic conditions. And that is basically, um, you know, we are able to bring that, amazingly speaking, you know, bring that all the way up to uh, chip development. So it's not just algorithm design that you're doing this testing with. So it's not after you have the vehicle, keep in mind, right? You are doing this kind of testing before the vehicle is ever built. Right? You're still defining these systems, defining these algorithms, defining the vehicle behaviors. And that's when you start testing some of the algorithms that you already have. How is that going to you know, behave? How is going to that fail? So we can fix those things from a sort of standpoint, for example. right? And bring that all the way down to a chip level, where when you're defining, defining these system on chips, right, the entire system being designed on a single chip, like the one with NVIDIA and things like that that are coming up, right? So be able to do those kinds of, at a chip design level, right, with our mentor products, be able to do those kind of testing while you're designing the chip for that application that you're going to do on a vehicle and be able to test a vehicle scenario while you're doing the chip design. I mean, that is just incredible that you'll be able to move this thing all the way left, all the way down to a chip design level at a transistor level, you know, at, at that sort of FPGA level. It's just amazing that you will simulate those kind of things, you know, integrate the chip design with chip verification, with control algorithm, and at a vehicle level, and have the vehicle actually think that, that it has a chip before the chip was ever built, ever fabricated. That's, that is that's where things are going. And these tools are just uh, mind-blowing. This is indeed mind-blowing. So that brings me to the, this question because we're talking a great deal about simulation. Now, traditionally, in automotive industry, we used game engines to simulate. So game engines 
as you know, if you have played Counter-Strike or some, some, sometimes you walk into a wall, they don't really, you know, simulate the physics as they should probably in avionic industry in, or, or somewhere. So how do you see this have an implication in our testing if we use game engine based simulation engine instead of, for example, defense industry? In defense industry, it's not the graphics that matters, but the actual physics matters more. So they simulate the physics more, they pay more attention to the physics than the, than the graphics. So what do you think about, about that? How can we get past this hurdle of using game engine for a long time? So that's where I think these tools that I was mentioning before uh, from TAS, uh, the QuizScan and Marimo, um, and all these kind of tools that we have now that are well integrated into each other, they are based off of that physics aspect of it. The, the vehicle dynamics part of it. The, all the models that are available in the library of these tools are physics-based models that are readily available. And then they integrate with the sensor models that are available from the vendors. A combination of that physical model, that physics-based modeling that you can do with tools, uh, with AIMSIM and all those you know, tools that we have, integration of that into these scenarios and superimpose them with the actual so sensor models and be able to validate your application software with that. I mean, that's where, you know, we are making a lot of headway uh, with OEMs and suppliers that they are kind of very much interested in buying these kinds of things. And not only that, I guess another you know, aspect to that, you know, the physics part of it is the optimization part of it. When you add this physics part of it, there's a lot of, uh, attributes that get added, like how you're going to optimize five different uh, parameters versus two, right? So in a, in a virtual, non-physical environment, you can, you know, eliminate uh, parameters and say, you know, I'm going to only work with these parameters, but easy, you know, mathematically speaking. But as you increase more parameters because of the physics part of it, now you all of a sudden have to worry about how you're going to optimize across, you know, three or four or five or six different parameters. That's where we have tools like Heats, where we can actually optimize with multiple parameters and see as to how the system is going to behave and which parameters I should be really concentrating on versus others. So those kind of things are also integrated into these scenario-based testing aspects from an optimization standpoint, from a parameter optimization standpoint. So that's another you know, area where I see a lot of growth happening. Uh, from okay. a physics standpoint. That makes sense. Now that we're talking about testing and uh, we're talking about massive amount of testing, we can do massive amount of uh, testing with, with these, these kind of virtual uh, t testing environment simulations. Now, we will be probably covering billions and trillions of miles in this kind of simulation. My question is, from a safety perspective, the question is how do you validate the validation? Because I'm asking this question from ISO 26262 perspective, in some of the cases, if it goes all the way to ASL D, we got to validate our validation, right? So how do you think that would be possible when we're talking about a magnitude of trillions of miles of data and uh, in a virtual environment? I guess one way to handle that, and most of the guys are trying to do it, is this whole notion of MBSE. Right, the whole sort of model-based system engineering aspect of it. Now, everybody's trying to do that. Although, I guess the key to success on that sort of val you know, how do you validate the validation kind of thing, is the fidelity of the models themselves. Right, how granular your models are, how accurate they are, what kind of validation you use to ensure that fidelity is there, ensure that the right models are being used across the chain, across the entire traceability that you have and how well are they linked together, you know? So having the right models at the right fidelity, right, at the right time available to the engineers that they are actually doing these kinds of validations, that's sort of the key on one side of it, right? The other side is when you start to validate how accurate these scenarios are, how accurate these, you know, are they totally synthetic or are they actually, you know, based on real world scenarios, you know, that again, you know, feeds into that. And then you add that with the sort of the virtual hill aspect of it, but it's, it's not totally physical testing, but it's sort of virtualized because now you have all these rain and all that thing kind of baked in that adds to that fidelity aspect of it. And now I am able to figure out 
whether the vehicle is going to skid or not. It's not just mathematical. It's not just model based. But I'm actually saying that okay, now this is what if I skid? Is the vehicle able to do the stability control, for example? Right? How much you know friction coefficient it can, can take? Can I do it on oil? Can I do it on uh, water? Can I do it on snow? Those kind of things. If you're able to do that virtually, right? It means that you know how real world that information is. You know when the software is saying snow. What is the data behind that? How accurate the data is, right? So if that can be validated in these tools like Prescan, you know that is validated. The snow has a certain testing done, and when you say snow, it knows what snow means from a friction standpoint. Or when you know when it's rain, what is, does it mean to the asphalt on the road? You know what kind of friction coefficient does it create? So that kind of modeling is already done, validated, and now from engineers, you don't have to worry about that. All you say is, I have a scenario. I'm going to add snow. I'm going to add add rain. I'm going to add sleet. I'm going to add some oil. I'm going to have my vehicle drive on that, and see if my stability control is going to actually going to do what it needs to do, right? And if it says yes, well, I'm pretty close to what I really was going to do with my physical testing, right? So now instead of me actually testing, you know, hundred miles of physical testing, I'm going to do maybe five. Because the rest of the 95 miles, I was able to do that on this virtual side of it. And that's the key, you know, with these high-end, call them uh, next-gen ADAS systems. It's just impossible. It's just not possible to do all the testing that is required. You need to have these tools come with the right fidelity of the data uh, and the right backbone to support the claim that when you add snow, it really means snow. So that's the stuff that, you know, these tools like Matimo and uh, Prescan and Heath and all that kind of built in from, from, from get-go. You know, like in Matimo, they have the whole anatomical, you know, to the bone, to the muscle. You have all the anatomically accurate data for certain demographics that if you're doing testing here in the U.S. versus in Japan, you, know, you need different anatomical you know, models for your occupants. Uh, so be able to do that and have the validation done using these models. So that's the holy grail as to you know, how accurate these models are going to be uh, all the way from sort of the right side of the V and the left side of the V kind of thing. Uh, be able to do that. Right. So uh, w- all these things are going to lead to more and more complexity. And one thing that I can't help asking you is automotive industry is extremely cost sensitive. If we think about the business model of autonomous vehicle, if we really want to make it safe, probably we'll, we're thinking about carpool kind of a model. Yeah, I mean, if every person has to own a vehicle, that could be a model that we have today, or uh, the next generation could be for a per person, a vehicle is for, is for me, an app, that I punch in my address, it picks me up and takes me from point A to point B. What do you think, in your opinion, would be the right direction to go to from cost perspective, from a probably also environmental perspective and uh, safety perspective? I guess on the autonomous side of it, um, we are definitely struggling with um, so the business model aspect of it is so how, how are you actually going to make money off of these things and what kind of features do we need to add today versus tomorrow what kind of stuff. They're also doing a lot of research, I guess, on the features that we have on the vehicles today. How many features are actually being used by the customers? Uh, I mean, there was a recent study where a lot of these ADAS features that we have, like lane assist and you know, lane departure and things like that, customers are actually switching them off. Uh, they don't want to use it, 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 you know, they don't like it or they are just somehow not understanding it or being more of an annoyance. Probably there is not enough trust on these systems. It may be the trust part of it too, right? But point being that a lot of engineering cost went in to actually build those features and put it in there. And some of those features were sort of given for free that customers didn't actually pay for. Right? It was part of the package kind of thing, and they just went for the ride, and some of the features now become standard. Uh, if, you, if you buy any vehicle out there today, you know, the standard 
feature set will include Linuxes, for example, or Lin departure warnings and things like that. It will include that. So you're not exclusively paying as a customer for that. So a lot of engineering costs go into that, and that's the kind of stuff that customers are, uh, some of the OEMs are looking at, that how do I optimize on the engineering cost? The first thing, obviously, that we've got to do is this sort of feature uh, approach, feature margins and feature sets. And so how all the engineering can be boiled down to what features are we going to make and what does it need to build that feature. And then, you know, building these marketing studies and find out, okay, these, these features actually make sense. Are we going to actually make money off of these? Or are we going to end up people not using them? So we might have to invent some other way of giving the same feature, but you know, make it more safe, make it more understanding, make it more trustworthy, like you said, and make it more less intrusive. When you go and you know, change your lane, and all of a sudden, if the cars are beeping loud, well, you don't want that, right? You want some other way of letting the customer know that you know you are personally getting into getting in a lane that has a vehicle in there or something, right? So those are the things that they're doing on, on the AV side. It's interesting. Um, you know, one is obviously the business model side of it as to how you actually make money off of these things. So you know, my guess is it's not going to be uh, anytime soon that you're going to have like more like a passenger kind of thing. It was more of a transportation kind of autonomous vehicles for businesses to integrate, you know, vehicles with, because there's less safety aspect to it, right? Because there's nobody in the car and the car has only packages in there. So let's say delivery vans or things like that. You know, those can be, you know, automated a lot easier, relatively, I guess, easier than having somebody inside the car. And now you got to worry about the liability of, you know, personal injury and things like that. So those kind of things are coming up faster, I guess, than sort of the occupant-based you know, autonomous vehicles. So transportation, if you will, is, is more going to come before uh, sort of passenger vehicle-based autonomous vehicles. And that's for consideration of safety perspective. You know, because safety is you know, relatively easier to work with when there is not a person inside the vehicle. And obviously the people outside, right? <laughs> you have to worry about people that are outside the vehicle. but you know, a lot easier that way. So I think that's where I, I, I that's what I'm seeing um, that companies are kind of focusing their efforts on. It's primarily driven by cost, as you said. Absolutely, absolutely. So another question to you, uh, probably this is this would be my last question, is uh, we're at the dawn of an era, era that will see massive, massive disruption in automotive industry. And three of the aspects of this disruption that's coming up is one we talked in a great deal about is autonomous vehicle. Second aspect, I believe, is going to be connectivity, connected vehicle. And the third aspect, electrification of vehicles. So with these three disruptive technologies coming up in the, in the industry, what do you think is going to be the most positive thing for Civilization, because autonomous vehicle is going to change the civilization, in my opinion. This is this would this would be one of one of the things that was like when we invented agricultural engines, steam engines, to to agricultural level revolution, industrial revolution, and this is going to be a revolution for human history. What do you think is going to be the most positive aspect of such massive disruption? 2011 time frame was the funny story. We our Ford, uh, there's a uh, you know, Ford Indian Association, and uh, there, was a, there was a program, and Bill Ford was coming there. And uh, I was tempted to ask that question to Bill Ford, and I happened to, you know, meet him in, in, in that gala, and, and I asked him about that. Hey, you know, all these things are happening, you know, and that was the 2011 time frame. And he was about, uh, around the same time he was, was going to give a TED Talk on that same topic, and he said, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that, uh, you know, how things are going to change. And, you know, I'm probably the only uh, automotive guy who's going to talk about the answer to all the things that are happening, you know, environmentally speaking, you know, the global you know, climate change and all those kinds of things, congestion, um, you know, all these things. And the answer is not going to be making more cars. The answer is going to be making smart cars, making cars integrate with the infrastructure so that you know, you can do a lot more with a lot less. 
And I thought, man, that, and that was 2011, I think. And, you know, that's where we are going now, right? All these things are happening, and that's sort of the positive touch to it, that how do we do a lot more with not less? You know, all this electrification, you know, less pollution, you know, and, and all that. But we, we are not sacrificing, you know, going from A to B, right? A to B is still there. Uh, you know, you'll be able to go there. And then when you start to integrate with mobility aspect, for example, it's, it's not just vehicles, but sort of multimodal mobility where you, the cars are integrated with bicycles, bicycles integrated with train systems. So you solve that sort of first mile, last mile kind of problems as well. So all these sort of smart systems, if you will, you know, are causing, you know, a lot more people to think about, you know, how can you do a lot more with a lot less? And I see that as a big positive. Overall, you know, everything you talk about, you know, autonomous, connected, electrification, all of that basically just boils down to that to me. Fascinating. So the most positive thing will be, we'll do a lot more with a lot less. I love that. Thank you so much, Piyush, for being here. It was fascinating. Nice to be here. You know, it was a pleasure talking to you, Asan. Amazing. So thank you so much for watching or listening to our podcast. If you have liked it, Feel free to subscribe to our channel, smash the like button, and share this video with your friends. Thank you so much for watching.